thanks for coming. Um, so I'm really excited, actually new to the PlayStation team. I'm heading up mobile, as mentioned, and uh, just doing a quick intro of our session this morning. So we have a bunch of really great indies that have been working with the PlayStation platform, and they're here to tell their own unique story, um, which I'm sure all of you are really excited to hear about and how we're partnering with them. So to start off, let's bring up uh, Graham Smith with Drinkbox. And we have Ian Dallas with Giant Sparrow. Sean McGrath, who has created Dyad, big winner last night. Congratulations, by the way. And we have our very own bearded wonder, Brian Silva. He's part of the PlayStation third party relations team and uh, heads up Pub Fund. And of course, uh, Mike, who's moderating the panel. So thanks everybody for coming and uh, take it away, guys. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, we're basically, we're gonna talk about um, publishing uh, and what these uh, wonderful indie developers have uh, experienced uh, with their journey on the PlayStation Network and the PlayStation 3 and PlayStation Vita. So um, what I'd like to do is just kind of ask a couple of broad questions and have you guys chime in with your thoughts. Um, and the first thing I want to ask you guys about, uh, Sean, this is something you brought up the other day, was uh, really what uh, publishing means for a video game and for an independent developer, and uh, just kind of touch on some of the aspects of, of what that all means, and, and I'd like to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Do I have to talk first? Yes, you do, because this was your idea. Shit. Um, well, I, w I wouldn't have worded it in such a way, but um, yeah, I think when I had started sort of working with Sony with Dyad, I had, um, you know, I had a game that was more or less done, and I really didn't appreciate how much other work that there was to actually getting it out. Like, it was, it was a lot of work, and there's a whole set of... Um, there's a whole set of stuff that needs to be done to actually publish a game, which is a lot different from developing a game. So when Sony first came to, to, came to me and they were like, oh, you can self-publish, like that meant nothing to me. And now after having actually done it, yeah, it's actually a really big thing. Like um, I didn't appreciate what self-publishing meant until I actually went through it and it's totally, completely insane relative to having a publisher and now I get why self-publishing is actually super, super important. And I think it's, you know, that was what sort of blew me away with, with, with was what self-publishing actually meant. And I still don't really know what it means, other than, a, other than a lot of work that somebody else doesn't do. So, Brian, can you talk a little bit about what that means for you on the publishing side? Uh, sure. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing, we, when we say you can self-publish on our platforms, it really is all the other elements that go into getting the game released on the platform. It's the ESRB ratings. It's the legal paperwork, reams and reams and reams of legal paperwork because we're transferring money back and forth and tax forms. I mean, it's it's all the other things that, you know, there's a whole huge big business end that has to happen to make it so that someone can buy a game on a digital platform. And so, you know, I think that as Sean found out as we handed him reams of paperwork and he's, yeah. <laughs> That it, it is all the additional things, and, and, and it's not, you know, it, it kind of goes with all the other elements that uh, I think Sean did extremely well at. It's the marketing, it's the PR, it's all those other elements that, you know, you s there's a reason EA has so many people who work in just the marketing and PR departments. It's a reason why SEA has so many people who work in the marketing and PR departments. It's a lot of extra work to put your game out there and have everyone uh, be able to find it and hear about it. And Sean did an amazing job on his own doing that exactly that kind of work. Well, I'd like to um, get everybody's uh, you know perspective on you know the what what, what I'd like to do is, is just have you guys walk us through your the timeline of your introduction to to SCEA and how you were approached uh, or vice versa about uh, publishing your game through PSN. And I'd like to know, but at, at what point during the, the development of your title did you, did you start brokering a deal with the company? Uh, so for us, uh, it was back uh, probably around 2009, 2010. We uh, 
we were we had a demo for our first game uh, about a blob, and we were showing it to different publishers. And we had a, a friend in Toronto who introduced us to someone at Sony Santa Monica, and uh, they evaluated the game and they passed on the game. But they they said, oh, you guys should talk to this this other group at SEA, uh, the Pub Fund guys. There's this new program. So that's how we first got introduced, and uh, our game our first game got approved for for Pub Fund for PlayStation Three, uh, and released uh, in 2011. Uh, and then we did another game for for the Vita launch called Mutant Blobs Attack, which was actually not a pub fun title, but Sony was still like super supportive with hardware and helping us get through a certain time for launch and uh, and marketing stuff. Uh, even though it wasn't a pub fun title, they still helped us with all, all that stuff. Uh, now we're working with them on the pub fun for our new title, Guacamole, and uh, we had already had the relationship in place at that. So so getting the pub fund the second time around was a lot quicker and an easier process. That's kind of our story. Uh, yeah, so I think I started showing the game in 2008 uh, online, and it was in the Sense of Wonder Night in 2009, and that was when Sony saw it online and uh, approached me. Uh, I think I got an email from one of their producers uh, saying, hey, do you want to come out to Santa Monica 10 miles away to have coffee? And that was, you know, totally doable. And we started talking uh, just, you know, very broadly about the game, and at that time, I had no idea what the game actually was. Uh, it was a little premature uh, on that end, but you know, I was trying to figure out how to take the kind of core mechanic of being in a white world and, and throwing paint and, and making that into a bigger experience. And uh, so we just sort of kept talking, and then I, I had a design doc finally after about like six months or so of, of mulling it over in my head, and uh, that was like around January of the next year. And then by March, April, GDC, uh, you know, like I'd been talking to Sony and some other publishers, and, and ultimately we decided to go with Sony because it just felt like they, you know, were, were on board with the game. They obviously had an interest very early on, uh, and for us, I think the one of the most important parts was that they had sort of done it before with that game company, and you know, a few other titles. Uh, so they knew, hopefully, what they were getting into. And originally, like the game was supposed to be a year and a half with five people or so. And I'd, I'd never made a game before, so I was off by uh, like 400% or whatever it is, <laughs> with ultimately 12 people and three years and a, a way, way bigger game. Um, not as big as the game design doc, so you know, it's a little bit smaller than on paper it was originally. But that's something that, again, I, I think was, was really great to have Sony not freak out about that and to know that, uh, you know, especially with people that have not made a game before, but even with, you know, people that have, uh, you know, these things get bigger and they change a lot. And they were interested in having something that was just, you know, fresh and interesting and new. And even though it's not the same game as it was, it's, it's hopefully still fresh and interesting and new. So having, you know, a publisher that was really into the same stuff that you were into uh, worked out really well for us. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just making uh, my thing. I was just working on it uh, sort of on my own. I had no intention of doing anything with it. And then I brought it to PAX East, and I built a gigantic moving arcade machine with a motor in it. And um, some people at Sony sort of noticed it then or noticed a little bit before that. And uh, I was just talking to them about, you know, pub about maybe them publishing it or... Um, me self-publishing it, and then the pub pump, uh program came out, and they, you know, they were somewhat interested in it, but the game was pretty terrible at one point. Um, so last year at Indicate, I showed them it uh, in my hotel room, and uh, at that point, they were like, "Yeah, yeah, we want this." So um, <laughs> after that happened, uh, I didn't talk to them for a little while, and then one of the guys at Pub Fund uh, messaged me on PSN and told me that uh, we got to get we got to get a Pub Fund agreement into place because we want to do a bunch of co-marketing on it. And so I got the message on PSN, and then two weeks later, uh, it was being shown at GDC and uh, you know a bunch of other uh, stuff that Sony did to market the game, which was super, super great. So that's how it worked for me. So Brian, can you talk a little bit about the Pub Fund and, and what that means and, and how these guys have used it uh, and how other developers have used it? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I think... So Pub Fund is a back-end guarantee for exclusivity. It's kind of like an exclusivity deal that you would see in a lot of places. Um, it's uh, advanced against royalties, so we recoup back into the fund. Um, so it keeps, as we put games into the fund and then money comes back, we're then able to fund more games. So we have a set amount that we were given to play with 
in about 2009. And I mean play with because when we started it, we, we had this vision of what we want it to be and I think we're still working with that vision. Um, but it really, um, I don't think my boss at the time, Rob Dyer, knew what we were gonna do with it. Um, I think if you were to ask him after two or three years before he left to go to Zynga that he still didn't know what we were doing with it. But he let us play, so that's that, that to us was everything. And really, it's, um, it's all about finding uh, incredible content that we want to highlight and show and have uh, exclusive on PlayStation Network. And it's really finding, you know, just really platform-defining experiences, games that we think tie in really well with the platform. So, I mean, we've done only nine titles to date. There's a lot of people who are like, well, you know, you have this big fun, you've done all these things. Uh, over three years, we've only done nine titles. We have two more, Guacamelee and Dragon Fantasy Book Two coming, but, uh, we, you know, we're, we've been fairly selective in the past, and we're still, I would say, in our growing stages on what we want to be. Okay. Uh, can you guys talk a little bit about how you've used uh, the pub fund? I mean, uh, I know that the, some of you have used, uh, some of you have uh, worked with Sony on some co-marketing. Uh, I think you guys are, uh, Ian, you're using some office space and some technical help from Sony. Could you guys talk a little bit about your experiences with, um, with, uh, with, you know, working alongside Sony? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's it, for the for our first PubFund deal uh, for about a blob. Uh, the main reason we wanted to go with it was just to offset the risk associated with you know making your own game, self-funding your own game, releasing it out to the world, and then you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if your game doesn't sell well, you know, your company just might totally sink. Or, uh, yeah, so it, it's basically like you're kind of ensuring your future. You, you kind of have a, this guarantee that you can bet on. As long as you finish the game, you know you're going to have this minimum that you're going to get, like, right away. Uh, and then you can do a lot better planning for what your next title is going to be, knowing that that's going to be there. Uh, without that, it's kind of like you're making a lot of guesses and, you know, there's a lot of different scenarios if it sells well or if it doesn't sell well. Uh, so it's just like a lot more stable. Um, <clears throat> and then in addition to that, uh, there's also uh, the kind of marketing and PR support that Sony can do that s like a small indie cannot do on their own. Like, for example, with Guacamelee, Sony is Sony's showing Guacamelee at a lot of different shows. Like we've been at E3, Gamescom, Comic-Con, at PAX. They're showing, they're showing our game in their booth a lot. And, you know, a lot of people are getting exposure to our game through Sony, uh, something that we would never be able to fund on our own. Uh, and just having that, having that available to us is like just a huge, huge advantage I think we have. Uh, uh, and it, it's costing us pretty much nothing, just like signing on with Sony is, is giving this huge benefit that we would never be able to do otherwise. So. Yeah, we're actually not funded through PubFund. Okay. Uh, we have just a standard developer agreement with contracts and, and milestones and, and all that. Um, so do you want to talk about that experience or do you want to save yeah. that for another? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, we have used all sorts of various Sony services that have uh, changed pretty dramatically over the course of the project, both you know in terms of like where we are in the project and then you know what the project needs and also you know like yeah the, the size of the project and and what's you know coming up this week. Uh, like in the beginning, there really wasn't much involvement. I mean, we were in their offices and we've been there the whole time, but I'd say for the first year or so. Uh, we really just like we met with our producer at Sony every you know week or two, and they gave us equipment. They helped us set up you know all of our networking and, and all that stuff. But they really weren't that involved at all. Um, and and yeah, maybe they should have been, but but it worked out well for us because uh, we were able to you know try a bunch of stuff that didn't work, and then ultimately you know find a few things that hopefully did. And uh, then about like a year or so into that, then we started getting uh, more. Uh, series about the project, we kind of like knew the direction, and uh, so we got some design support, which you know we hadn't really had for a year or two up until that, but ended up being really helpful at that point, just to get like an outside observer that uh, you know could weigh in and you know say like what they thought uh, about things, and it was never um, you know telling us that we had to or or couldn't do things. It was more just you know kind of feedback on, on that, and. Uh, you know, I think one of the things that's really helpful working with the publisher is that as an indie, you know, you do maybe like one game every two years if you're fast. I guess like one one game every month if you're a cactus, but for most of us it's like, 
you know, two to three years between games. And working with a publisher, uh, you know, they're doing one game every month. And, or, or more, and so they have a lot more experience seeing things like, oh, that's you know, going to be kind of a troublesome area, or like that feels really interesting, and so their feedback, you know, aside from just being somewhat unbiased, uh, is also helpful because they've got a lot more experience with you know, uh, other games, and you have to weigh that because sometimes you know, they have experience with things that are not your game, and, and maybe it's not so relevant, but uh, we also got a lot of experience, uh, from, or got a lot of help from uh, Sony folks on the God of War side that have worked with the PlayStation for you know years and years and years, and you know for us the game as it got bigger and more complicated started to have teething pains with you know things that we were doing naively in the code that ended up you know really hurting our frame rate and having uh, folks that we could go to uh, for that kind of like really specific knowledge uh, was super helpful for people that like really know their platforms. And then, uh, yeah, in the last year or so, there's just been a lot of help on the production side uh, going through QA in, you know, three different Sony territories. And it turns out that, like, Sony Japan has totally different concerns than Sony Europe and Sony America. And, again, having someone who has gone through this, like, last month with Starhawk, you know, versus you going at it for the first time uh, was, was really helpful. So I made a really weird game. Um, basically by myself with a musician and it's just it's just weird and um the fact that my ridiculously weird game was at you know E3 uh it was on the like right when you walked into um the main hall at GDC it was right there on the first TV on the right um there was uh some other promotion that Sony did where they they drove a bunch of journalists around in uh rented look-alike uh, trolleys from uh, San Francisco and they drove them around to show them my fucking weird game. Um, that's pretty amazing. Like, that's pretty ridiculous. Um, if you think about it, like, why would they do that? Um, I'm still trying to figure that out. But it, it, I made a, a really strange, weird game that got a lot of mainstream press because Sony helped me out and backed it. And that's pretty amazing. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Well, Sean, I, <laughs> I, w I wanted to follow up on that. You, you know, you obviously had to put a lot of work uh, uh, of your own into publicizing the game and showing the game to, to press. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I, I'm kind of curious to hear what you guys have to say about, uh, you know, what's involved in doing your own self-promotion uh, and your own publicizing of your games. Uh, well... So what I did is when I thought the game was good, which is what at Indicate last year is when I thought it was finally good, I sent an email to basically all of my friends in the game industry. Uh, and Kelly helped me out big time too, wherever she is. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, and Nathan Vela helped me out too. A lot of people helped me. And I sent an email to all of them, and I was like, I need every single press contact that you guys know who is actually cool. And so I can show them my weird thing. That's how I met you. Uh, Brandon Sheffield hooked me up with you. And I was like, I need to see, I need to see everybody and show them this this game because it's really important to me. And so that's how I did it. Um, and then I got a hotel room at every single major event, and I showed, I gave a one hour. I put people in the in the game, left them, walked out, came back in an hour, and then talked about the game. I stole that idea from Jonathan Blow, but um, it's a good idea, and that was how I promoted the game because I thought it was something that you could, you know, I didn't need to handhold you through it. You could just sort of play it. So that's how I was able to promote the game. And I think Sony recognized that I was putting a lot of work into it. Like I brought it to PAX and I built a, I built a huge arcade machine with a motor in it that when you sit in it, it rotates like this. Um, you know, so I did a lot of weird stuff like that. And it seems like Sony appreciated that. And then they were like, well, if he's putting a lot of work into it, I guess we will too. And so that's how it worked out for me. Uh, I highly recommend everybody do a lot of promotion. It's good. Yeah, Ian and Graham, can you talk about your experiences? Yeah, so I'm in kind of an interesting experience because the game hasn't come out yet. So really, I think we should be having this panel a month or two from now uh, because I've got a lot of ideas maybe about how the marketing, you know, how effective it's been or, or whatnot. Uh, but I don't know. Uh, you know, we, uh, we should be coming out in about three weeks from now. So we'll find out then. I think coming into the publishing deal, I thought that marketing would be something that uh, we get a lot more support, I guess, from Sony, and that they would sort of wave a wand and 
and things would just be, you know, uh, be awesome and, and AAA and, and whatever. We get a lot of, you know, attention just for that, and we could focus more on the game. And I think what turned out to be that really the most effective marketing we could do was stuff that came more from us personally. And, uh, you know, marketing did lend a bit of support, especially early on, but we found that we actually would rather do it ourselves. So there's a lot of, you know, um, kind of setup work that they could definitely do, like, you know, getting us at Gamescom or PAX or wherever, uh, which is great, but, you know, it's nothing magical. I think ultimately, uh, yeah, I mean, we're the best people to market the game because we know the most about it, and, you know, it's way more interesting to talk to somebody on the journalist side, you know, who, who made the game rather than, you know, the, the Sony marketing folks that, uh, you know, that are doing 20 of these. So it's sort of, it's the opposite of what I was talking about before, where... Uh, you know, someone who has a lot of experience making games, uh, you know, maybe has great design advice, but on the marketing side, they've kind of, they've marketed 10 games in the last month. They don't really know what's special about your game. And so I, I think our experience is probably similar to most indies that, uh, you know, we, we did a lot of, or are trying to do a lot of grassroots stuff, uh, you know, not because we have to, but because we think that that's the most effective way to communicate the game. And for our game, you know, we feel like, it's a really personal experience. That that's part of what is interesting for the player is that it's something that feels really different from everything else that's out there. So, you know, we tried to carry that over into the marketing, you know, to make the interviews and, and everything that we're doing, you know, feel a little bit more personalized and interesting. Um, yeah, like we've got, if, if you've got time uh, and you can check out the Unfinished Swan uh, booth at, at, uh, at Indicate, we've got these amazing posters that our, our producer Max Geiger did that are, there's like a limited set of 50 or 60, so you gotta get there uh, at the right time, but they're, um, uh, like early on in the game, the first year, we did these splat tests to see like what splats actually look like when you make them in the real world, and uh, we just had these like laying around our office for the next two years. It was a stack of paper with these like crazy splats on them, and he made posters out of them with like, you know, everyone signed them, and, and it's just like, yeah, like, Everything that we, we do on the marketing side, we try as much as possible to make it personal and, and unique. So not something that Sony can really help with, but they were helpful for a lot of other things, you know, as far as like getting a trailer up online and, you know, and all that. So it's give and take. Yeah, I, I totally agree with what Ian's saying about like, the per, like having a personal connection with, with the, the media uh, when you're doing marketing stuff. Uh, and when, I guess when we started, uh, we really didn't, like, for our first game about a blog, we really didn't know anything about marketing, and we were trying to learn the ropes, and uh, we would send emails to press and wouldn't get responses because they had no idea who we were, and uh, we would, you know, spend thousands of dollars on a booth at PAX, for example, and not have that many people showing up and not have that much coverage coming out of PAX. Uh, so we kind of struggled at the beginning, like, trying to, just playing with things, trying to figure out how to do marketing. Um, and then I... I I remember uh, at one particular PAX, uh, uh, we came out and we didn't get that much coverage, but I remember seeing some of the other indie games around us was getting, were getting a lot of coverage. For example, like Vessel, like John's here in the audience. Uh, and uh, I remember asking him about like, how did you get so many interviews? How did you get so much coverage? And he told us, oh, I, I'm working with a PR agency. My publisher has a PR agency that I'm working with. Um, and then I went to a talk at GDC. One of the Burn Zombie Burn guys was talking about how they were working with a PR agency as well. So actually, we started trying to work with a uh, PR agency for our, for our second game. And what they have that we don't have is like this huge list of contacts, uh, and they can ha you know they offload a lot of setting up meetings and stuff like that. So you s you can go to a trade show and have like all these big sites coming to talk to you, and you still have this personal thing with them, but you don't have to spend all the time sending the emails to set up that. Um, and that actually helped us a lot for, for Mutant Blob's attack. Uh, and now we were continuing to work with, the, with those guys uh, going forward. Uh, even, when, even when Sony's supporting us, like by putting us in E3, for example, we'll try and work with our PR agency to help set up meetings with a lot of people. And now, actually, since we've been doing that, we actually have a lot more personal connections. So like the, the importance of this PR agency is, is kind of going down uh, because we can mail people directly. But having that just as, I w as we were starting up was like a huge benefit for us. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about what that means for you uh, working with an outside PR firm in terms of budgeting and workload? And yes, so it's not cheap, but uh, the we we talked to a whole bunch of different ones, um, and you know compared prices and got references and stuff like that. And we actually ended up going with the same company that the Burn Zombie Burn guys were using. Uh, they're called MMPR. Um, 
and uh, they they recognize that because we're like a small indie studio that they have to you know set their their costs appropriately. So while it's a little bit expensive, uh, it's definitely worth it. We think in the long run, uh, because because yeah, like it, w when you go to a trade show or or whatnot, you're spending thousands of dollars for a booth, and you don't have if you don't have any coverage coming out of it, then that was like wasted money. So just adding this little bit of extra, you know, to to get a ton of coverage really helps. So. Brian, could you talk a little bit about uh, what you guys do on the, the marketing promotion side for these titles and how you have kind of approached uh, each individual case? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it, it really depends. So one of the big things we do is we work with um, setting up release dates. We move Sean kind of all over the calendar to find the spot that we thought would be the best spot for him, knowing what was coming and when it was landing. You know, we wanted to stay away from sound shapes because we didn't want a lot of comparisons and we didn't want um, to just be like, oh, if I had to choose between the music game this week, I, you know, I'm going to choose this one. And also, first party is going to have uh, a, a bigger marketing and PR budget than, than we can come up with. But, you know, it, with something with Papo and Yo, we knew that street date. We moved it. But we knew that street date uh, at E3. So I mean, if if we, you know, even if Sean ga Sean's game came out first, we didn't at E3. We didn't know what his street date was. We were still in the process of trying to find that that spot. But Papo, I, we knew what when we were going to land. Um, we came in. Uh, we actually came in a week to get away from Counter Strike. But um, Really, it's it's trying to set those things up. Like you know, there's been a lot of talk about next week's release on PSN and and why we put so many games there. Well, we put so many games there because we knew when his game was coming, coming, and we're like not gonna, you know, we don't want to drop RCR and Joe Danger and a bunch of other stuff right on top of Swan because Swan. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's just you know, it, it's uh, really it's it's. We try and help where we can, you know, out in the Indicate area, you're, you know, Guacamole is there, Swan is there. There's also a bunch of games that aren't pub fun. They're just games we like. Retro City Rampage, and there's a game called Sunflower, and there's just a bunch of strange, quirky things, and we help as much as we can, not just on the pub fun side, but for everyone, you know, uh, whether it's working with Retro City Rampage to help him find a list of people to send review code to, or, um, you know, we, we do as much as we can with the limited resources that we have of around six people to help with these things. But we provide as much support on all areas that we possibly can, whether it's Nick Sutner, who's also in our group, talking about the games on the official PlayStation blogcast or trying to get interviews with the creators on the blogcast so that we can add an avenue of PR, um, adding, you know, getting people on the blog. Um, all these, these are all things that we work extremely hard to make sure that we have opportunities, not only for our pub fund titles, but for all the titles that are self-publishing on our platforms. Uh, could you guys talk a little bit about the, uh, what level of design and development input Sony has during the, the process, if, if any? I mean, uh, are they, have they been relatively hands-off or, you know, I'm just kind of curious about what your experiences are. Uh, so, Sony will provide feedback at various points along the development cycle. Like uh, part of part of the process of of uh, you know releasing a game on a, a PlayStation platform is you have to submit uh, to concept approval multiple times, and and when you get the results back from Sony, there's usually a list of feedback. Um, so a, a lot of the feedback is uh, is like just suggestive kind of things, but it's it's you know the the people who are writing up this feedback you know they play a lot of games and they know a lot about games and usually the feedback is uh, sometimes critical, but like often like most of the points in there are very valid. So when you when you when you're taking this feedback, you have to go through it point by point to think about okay, you know they're right. What should we do to fix this? And that's kind of like the the biggest way that we've interacted with them where they're giving us like design inputs. And also, you know, when we started doing this, this with Sony, we started to realize how valuable this feedback was. So then we would send them builds outside of that as well. Just say, hey, what do you guys think? You know, try, try this out. Uh, give us any feedback you have. 
Um, so it's just like, it's just how, basically we treat it as like another resource we can get for helping us to improve the game. And it, it's, it's never, I, we never get the feeling where Sony's like, we want this feature, we want you to do this feature, do this feature. It's never like that. It's always more like suggestive, like trying, working together to try and make a better game. Right, because you have, uh, you know, the PS3, PS Vita functionality built into Guacamelee, right? Yeah, that's right. So one of the features that, actually, so that was completely our own idea. Uh, we went, we showed Guacamelee 83 in the Sony booth, and while we were there, we played a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, PS3 and Vita games, and there's a bunch of the games we're using this cross-play feature where you can use the Vita as a controller. Um, but all the ones that we played were just, they were showing the same thing on the Vita screen as they were on the, the television screen. Um, when we came back from E3, we were talking about doing a new demo for PAX, uh, PAX Prime. And we were just, basically we were going through all of the different features that, because we, we knew at that point we were going to be releasing Guacamelee on both uh, PS3 and PS Vita. So we were looking at all the connectivity features like the cross save and the cross control and just trying to think of ways we could, you know, not inexpensive ways that we could, you know, use these cross platform features. and. Uh, the cross control, at first we thought, okay, well that's kind of a boring feature, but then when we came up with the idea of having like, the game has, it's like a Metroidvania style game in a big open world, uh, we thought, okay, well what if we have the mini-map on the Vita while you're playing on the PS3? That would actually be a useful feature. Uh, and then we did a little bit of investigation into like the, the documentation and we talked a little bit with Sony about the feature. Uh, and it actually turned out, it, w it was actually gonna be pretty simple relatively inexpensive feature to put in there so we so we did it for PAX and you know we're showing the same thing we'll be showing the same thing in the fire hall here um, it's yeah so so really that came from us and it was more because it was inexpensive to do and we thought it would be a valuable feature for people who who have both platforms people would actually want to use that yeah for us it was a, a really evolving process in terms of how much design um, you know kind of commentary that we got from our, our Sony producers and, and other folks. Um, I think the most helpful for us was the high level, uh, kind of like, oh, this, this looks really interesting. You should explore that area. Because uh, there's a lot of times where, you know, I mean, we do a lot of play tests, but uh, just having someone that is playing the game like almost every day, you know, that can, can offer ideas is, uh, is really helpful. And I think Sony deliberately seemed to try to stay away from giving us a lot of very specific feedback. Uh, like I've heard horror stories from other developers that have worked with publishers where, you know, you'll have a contract that will say like, oh, there have to be two vehicles in this game. And you decide like, well, actually like one vehicle is plenty. And then the publisher is like, no, 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 you got like, you agreed to this. And then the game is worse uh, just because, you know, it's, it's easier I think for the producers to, you know, work from a, a set of lists and, for our game, you know, we didn't really know what it was gonna be, so it's hard to say like, oh, this thing isn't, you know, in the game, and like, yeah, because the game is totally different. It's not the same game that it was. Uh, I, I can only think of, of one time where it was kind of like a, a semi-negative reaction where uh, we had an issue with the game not feeling alive enough. Uh, because and it's something, going back to the original prototype of the game, that it's like a very static world, and you want the world to be relatively static, so you can kind of have a sense of what's going on as you're feeling your way through it. And uh, like our, our Sony producers at the time had this idea of like, okay, like here, like, and we, we brainstormed with them. So, okay, here are some things that we think would help. And one of the things was like, uh, we have these um, hanging clotheslines in the world in places and like, oh, you know, like maybe those should just move. And we had all these awnings in the world and maybe they should like sway in the wind. And those damn awnings, like they took so much time and they just were not worth it. And we had this problem like six months ago where we're like, why is our frame rate so bad here? And it turned out like those damn awnings were still in the game. And I swear we got rid of all of them, but no, like, there were actually a, a few there. And so it's good if, if they can stay at a high level and be like, you know what, the world should be more alive. And then, and I think generally they did this. It's just like the one time I can think of on the whole project where we really like got some bullet points and we're like, all right, we're gonna do these things. But when they, you know, and saying that the world in this area of the game like was not alive enough, totally valid concern. And I think we addressed it, but in totally different ways that ended up being, you know, cheaper for us in a lot of ways and then also just better for the player. Uh, so yeah, I think having generally the, the high level design feedback was, was really helpful for us. Uh, and they, except in the one case I think of over three years, which is a pretty good batting average, uh, you know, they, they stayed, stayed to that high level. Yeah, Sony didn't tell me to do anything. 
Um, I, I think they recognized that I would not be interested in hearing what they had to say <laughs> about the design. And um, I think at one point somebody said, hey, maybe it would be cool with multiplayer. And I said, no. And 3D, 3D would actually break your head. So um, 3D might have been cool, but no. Um, yeah. We also got the multiplayer note. Uh, oh, sorry? We, we got a new producer, and the first note he had was, have you thought about multiplayer? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they, they, they were like, it wasn't even like a serious thing. They, they, he was just like, hey, I think it would be really cool with multiplayer. And I was just like, that's not happening. And they were like, oh, all right. And then they never actually gave me any feedback. Um, <laughs> Which was good because I think they recognized that I was completely uninterested in hearing their feedback, so they they just stayed away. So that was good. That was nice. Yeah, I would say that you know, Sean and I had some lively discussions about a lot of things around his game, but I they were that just that there were discussion back and forth. It was more, what do you think of this, and not us saying you have to do this and. I, it ultimately, at the end of the day, when working with Pub Fund or you know self, you know you're self-publishing. It's his game. You know, I don't own it. And Sony doesn't own it. We we've, we've worked out a deal, and we have a deal. And but every all the rights and everything else are are his. And it's more about his vision and his passion than what we could try and cram in to fit a bullet point, because it's just not. Of in, that's not of interest. That's you know we're not going to cram things into uh, ask someone to cram something into a game that's going to ultimately hurt their game. It's it's all about making that game as good as possible and how you know well, as Graham said how could he use some functionality that would be really cool and it's not going to have a na it's it's only positive for the game as opposed to hey you need to make your game use this controller or this element or have full online play or any of that because ultimately that's his choice. Could you talk kind of broadly about the, the nature of the deals that you guys make and, and in terms of like if, if these guys are retaining the rights to their properties, you know, that's part of the deal, but what else is involved in setting up those, um, setting up those contracts? Money and time. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, it's a, it's about a, a set amount of money for a set period of exclusivity, and that set period of exclusivity can change from game to game. And um, but yeah, ultimately, it's it's money and time. I, you know, we have in there also all the co-marketing opportunities and things of that nature that 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 we work towards. But mostly, that, those are the two elements. Okay. In, in terms of uh, people coming to you uh, looking for a self-publishing deal. What are the things that they should really know before they get in touch with you? And you know, I'd like to hear what you guys have to say, uh, it, just in terms of advice in the, in the same space. Um, so the first thing you have to know is that to self-publish, all you have to be is a licensed developer. That's it. You, there's as soon as you're licensed to develop on the PlayStation platforms, you can sell your own content. Now, if you want a pub fund deal, that's something totally different. Um, really. Uh, if you come to me and you say, what idea do I want? What genre do I want? Um, what am I looking for? We've prob probably already missed the mark. Um, for me and, and my group, it's really about what game are you doing that you always wanted to do and what do you have a huge amount of passion for? Um, we will sometimes look at what a game genre is. Do we have too many of this? Do we have you know, is this game look like a knockoff of something first party's doing? You know, we, we will look at that for pub fun, but mainly what we're looking for is creators and, and projects that have a lot of passion behind them that are doing something innovative, interesting, and ultimately will better the platform. Um, that, that's really, for us, everything. Um. So I don't really, wasn't really listening to the question, but I think I get the gist of it. Um, I, I think the most important thing is to just have like a really good game and not worry about any of the other stuff until you have a really good game. And then once you have a really good game, then it's actually worth talking to somebody. But if you don't have like the greatest game ever made, it's not even worth approaching Sony or a publisher, in my opinion, because you should probably be focusing on that before you're focusing on really anything else. So that's how I feel about it. 
Yeah, I think it, the advice would depend on, on the scope of the game. Uh, but if you're thinking of making a game anything like the unfinished Swan, uh, good luck to you. Uh, but I, I think, and, and maybe this is true for any game, but you know, going back to sort of what Sean said, uh, the most important thing I think is to know what the kernel is of the game. That for the unfinished Swan, it was the specific sense of wonder that you get being in a space and not knowing what is out there or, or what you expect to be out there and then having the tools to discover that for yourself. And the game changed dramatically as, as I think a lot of games do. Uh, but if you know the kernel of the game, then you can evaluate whether or not all these totally random things that you didn't expect to ever be thinking about actually like help that, that kernel or not. Because uh, that's the player experience is ultimately, hopefully, what is in, in that kernel. Um, and then, yeah, like knowing what your game is, especially if it's going to be a, a bigger game and you're going to get you know, more people involved. Uh, the, the more people you have, the less wiggle room. Uh, you, know, you, you can change the game at, at that point. So I guess just yeah, knowing your game uh, would be. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of feel like, uh, I don't know if this is entirely true, but the, the Pub Fun guys seem to be a lot more on the ball with uh, when when indie games are like a little bit more experimental or much more willing to take a risk than like a bigger publisher would, I think Dyad is a good example of that. And and uh, like about a blob, same thing. Like we 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 didn't go straight to Sony. We talked like even with Guacamole, we were talking to a, a lot of different publishers. And um, it it just seems to me like uh, like even with Guacamole, we got pretty far in discussions with a lot of people, and it, we ended up going with Pub Fund just because they they presented us with the best deal. But the the type of games that are coming out of the program, I I feel like are it's more accessible to to indie developers because you know indie developers like to try and do new and innovative things, and and these guys are uh, they're much more open to that than like a bigger publisher who would be less willing to take a risk uh, would be. So uh, that's why that's why I think they're like basically like a good fit for, for indies to be talking to. Could you talk a little bit about some of those other uh, experiences with other publishers that kind of kind of had you the, uh, steer a little more closely to PubFun? Well, yeah, it, the way it kind of works is that the more people that get involved, the more pieces of the pie do not end up coming to you in the end. So uh, like for Guacamole, we were talking to different publishers about you know releasing on Xbox, uh, but when we we put the numbers down on paper, like th they, we were still going to self fund the game, uh, and you know market the game ourselves uh, as much as we could. Uh, all they would really be adding would be a release slot on another platform for us, and then they would be taking a big chunk of the royalties of that. And uh, when you put the numbers down on paper, uh, and you compare like what they're offering versus what the pub fund is offering, it actually the the scales kind of tipped in the balance of the pub fund because you have less people taking money out of the equation before before you get your royalties in the end. So um, that's kind of why we ended up going with the pub fund, even though that means we were not going to be releasing on Xbox we have, because we're exclusive to Sony. It still made financial sense to go that direction for us. And and I think that there's a few more twists and turns as, in there as well. And hopefully, I'm not talking out of school. We had, you know, we kind of made an offer on Guacamole early on, um, and it got turned down by, by Drinkbox because they didn't feel that we had done our proper duty. And I think when we saw Meat and Blob Attack and then we saw later on more Guacamole and saw the progression of Drinkbox as a studio and, and the progression of their, ga of their gameplay from About a Blob to Meat and Blob Attack into Guacamole is... Astronomical. <laughs> it's a pretty big leap, and it's an impressive leap, and their gameplay keeps getting better and better and better. And we saw that game at PAX East, and we came back into the office and said, we need that. We want that on our platforms. That needs to stay on our platforms, and that became our number one goal right after that. 